Some of the elders of Israel came to me and sat down in front of me, Ezekiel writes in chapter 14. And then the word of the Lord came to me. The old prophet says, Son of man, these men have set up idols in their hearts and put wicked stumbling blocks before their faces. Should I let them inquire of me at all? Therefore speak to them and tell them, this is what the Sovereign Lord says, when any of my people sets up idols in their heart and puts a wicked stumbling block before their face and then goes to a prophet, I, the Lord, will answer them myself in keeping with their great idolatry. I will do this to recapture the hearts of my people who have all deserted me for their idols. Friends, welcome back to the Ransomed Heart Podcast. John Eldridge here in the studio with Craig McConnell, continuing a conversation from last week on the longing of the human heart, the literal capacity biologically and soulfully for addiction and idolatry and just beginning to think through some of the categories here of, oh my goodness, what do we do with these hearts of ours that were created for absolute paradise, created for ecstasy yeah. in a world like this? And, and frankly, even in a Christianity like this, I mean, let's just be honest about the partial here. Yeah. In this passage from Ezekiel, God will come after the idols that we set up in our lives in order to recapture our hearts. Mm-hmm. I mean, you, you hear his fierceness, you hear his jealousy, but it's not unkindness. He's not simply mad. You hear in this, I want to recapture your hearts. And I think that just as a category of what have I given my heart over to? And another diagnostic that we just read here is, well, what's God coming against? Mm -hmm. What is he standing in the way of? You know, I remember, oh, this is a tough one. I remember reading a beautiful, heartbreaking letter from a woman a number of years ago, writing in, losing her marriage, Mm -hmm. asking for prayer. And the way that she was describing it, she was describing it as, I'm shaking Every day, uncontrollably, I'm breaking down. Mm. I'm desperate. i having panic attacks. You know, my life is literally unraveling psychologically as wow. well as circumstantially. And this was a multi-page letter. It was very, very like that, very desperate through the whole thing. And I just, look, at, I'm going to take my shoes off and say, like, I understand. I understand. However, there's a difference between the pain and the grief of loss and that. Mm -hmm. The the, I'm desperate, I'm shaking uncontrollably, I'm grasping. And you want to go, wow, she made an idol of her marriage Mm -hmm. and to lose it felt like death. Mm -hmm. And there's absolutely no accusation in this at all. I'm just trying to help us find some diagnostics, you know, like when it feels like you're losing something and it feels like death. Yeah. Yeah. John, on our last conversation, you were reading from 1 John, and I think another diagnostic is just relationally, how are things going with those close to you, with the people in your world? I can recall counseling, this has actually happened a couple of times, but counseling a husband and wife in my office and just getting down into some deeper issues, kind of below the waterline, using the iceberg illustration, and hearing the husband explain why he's not intimate with his wife, why he's not pursuing her, fighting for her romancing her. And he shared with me in front of her that his house being clean and neat is better than sex. I remember my reaction, this poor, 
woman. Yeah. Designed for intimacy. Mm -hmm. Designed to love. Designed for a life that involves others and relating. This guy, bless his heart, was settling for a neat, clean house. And wow, you go, that can touch something that your wife can't or doesn't or you won't allow? Right. Just so our idolatry, that there's consequences, there's collateral damage. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Thus, why God wants to come after them. And thank God. It's right? like, yeah. I'm not going to leave you there. I'm not going to leave you there. So a fascinating question is, what is he thwarting, gang? Mm -hmm. What in your pursuits might God be thwarting that would reveal you made an idol of it? Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, there's the battle. Obviously, there's war. But so oftentimes, our reaction to things, it's not just loss. It's not just legitimate sorrow. My goodness, legitimate grief. There's either an anger, mm -hmm. a rage there that you don't dare touch this, you know, or there's the shaking uncontrollably. I'm falling yeah. apart. I, you know, the symptoms of, oh my goodness, you know, this is more than a joy that you experience as a gift from God. This is something that you go to for life. Yes. You go to for life. And to accurately diagnose or to identify which God will do, he'll come after you, what your idols are. I mean, for him to say, step away from that, as you said just a few minutes ago, it feels like death. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just watch your reaction. I mean, it is life. Oh, my gosh. I remember years ago I was on a speaking trip in – Oregon, where I spent a lot of my boyhood summers. And I love fly fishing. I love the West. I love gorgeous cattle ranches. And, you know, for me, that's my little piece of Eden. You know, other people, it's the beach. Other people, it's, you know, the excitement of a city and city life. But for me, it's ranch land, ranch country, fly fishing, summer days. And I remember pulling the car over and I was just out in the countryside and the cottonwoods were absolutely gorgeous in their summer glory. Just everything was brilliantly green and the alfalfa fields were just so fragrant in the air and horses, herds of horses running and grazing in the fields. And I was just sitting there letting the, the smells and the warm breezes and I was on my way to go fly fishing. And Honestly, honestly, what popped out of my heart was, I think I could be happy here without God. Mm. Wow. <laughs> it was like, whoa, holy cow. I had yeah. no idea, had no idea that that had become my yes. Eden, right? Yeah. My personal image of, you know, if I can just make life work out, I'm good. Yeah. And if that's with God, great. And if not, great. I just want life to work out. And Craig, you were saying something before we started recording today that part of the dilemma of this is the partial nature of life and even the partial nature of Christianity. Yeah. You know, and this is what really begins to throw folks is life with God is wonderful. But life with God, you're not home yet. Mm -hmm. Life with God is partial. Mm -hmm. Now we see in a Glass, though dimly, Scripture says. But then we will see face to face, yeah. right? Yeah. We love him now, right? And Scripture says, even though you do not see him, you love him, yeah. right? And there is a partial nature. We are not in Eden yet. Yeah. You know, behold, he has not made all things new yet. Yeah. Yeah. And while design for ecstasy is our design and yearning and longing, we have to find God, the true God, the one God, in such a way that we can move through the seasons of life that are very difficult mm -hmm. and very hard. And mm -hmm. you may be suffering or, or whatever, but there is some relationship with God that embraces and knows the partial 
will end. And Christianity never promises us in this act, in Act 3, on this planet, that we are going to have 24-7 ecstasy. Right. Right. Here's another diagnostic, friends. We're trying to unpack this complex thing called idolatry because it's a – man, it's poisonous. It is not only a soul killer. It kills your life with God, destroys your world, wreaks havoc. Here's another diagnostic, Craig. When you read the older saints, when you <laughs> read the gospels, there is so much talk of reward – you know, Jesus says, uh, you know, if you're faithful, surely you will not lose your reward. And mm. if you give a cup of water to a prophet, you'll receive a prophet's reward. And, mm -hmm. you know, bless your, those who are persecuted for my name's sake, for great is your reward in heaven. There's all this talk about reward, 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 reward. In Revelation, he says, behold, I am coming and my reward is with me. Well, here's the thing. I never, ever, 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 ever hear Christians talk about their reward, the anticipation yes. of the coming reward. It's not even a category. Yeah, yeah. And I think what that reveals is, oh, you're hoping for it now, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. I mean, if you're not anticipating, even in St. Patrick's Breastplate, which is a prayer that we love and is on our website and on our app, you know, we, he's talking about, in hope of reward. So there's this not yet anticipation of something really wonderful coming that I'm banking on big time. And I'm really putting a lot in that of hope, expectation, and foregoing a lot right now in order to assure the coming reward. You don't hear – I don't hear anybody mm -hmm. talk about reward. Mm -hmm. What does that say? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's all here and now. Grab all you can get. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. I was talking in the previous podcast, friends, about Imelda Marcos and how I'm actually having a growing level of compassion for her. She was the wife of the former dictator in the Philippines, and the two of them lived an extraordinarily, ridiculously lavish lifestyle. And Imelda Marcos' obsession was shoes, designer shoes, high-level, you know, Italian, Paris fashion shoes. And she, like, like had warehouses built to house all of the pairs of the shoes. And I just heard a story yesterday. I was chatting with some guys, and they live in a fairly wealthy neighborhood, but he was describing the indulgences of their neighbors. And he says, oh, yeah, this one gal, she gets on her husband's corporate jet, takes her friends to Vegas for lunch, and they go shoe shopping. And they come home for dinner. You know, and he was kind of rolling his eyes and just going, oh, my gosh, can you believe these people? And I'm like, I get it. Yeah. Oh, I get it. I get it. My soul longs for Eden. I yearn for paradise. Where's mm -hmm. happiness? Mm -hmm. And, and if you are not attentive to that and you do not shepherd your aching soul with some diligence and some loving attention, you're going to give it over to idols. Yeah. So how do we break free from this? I mean, God is coming after us to recapture our heart. The issues are hard. Mm. He's pursuing us to the degree that we have idols. Our life has voids, emptiness. We're thirsty. Idols never truly answer the question or address the need we have. So we've got to be starving and hungry. It speaks to the power of, uh, I guess, this commitment to find life apart from God that we stick with these things that don't ever work. And what's it going to take? Yeah. Blaine graduated undergrad a couple years ago and for his graduation present we gave him a fly fishing trip in Alaska. That's his cup of tea. Mm -hmm. Sam got a plane ticket to Europe to backpack with some friends. Blaine got a fly fishing trip and I went with him. His father-son thing and we had a lot of hopes put in this trip. We're fly fishermen. We're diehard guys and man we were looking forward to just killing it. You know just this fabulous seven days in the wilderness just having this ecstasy Right. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't. It was good. 
there were moments. For the most part, it was okay. It was just okay. Weather wasn't great. Fishing wasn't great. And, and I'm pissed. I remember I'm standing in this, this boat. We're on this unbelievably gorgeous wilderness river. And, and it's not happening. It's not coming together. And I'm like, Jesus, what do I do with this? And, and he said, make me your treasure. Mm. Make me your treasure. And like in that one moment, I was just suddenly realized, oh, one, I haven't, you know, I forgot, I wandered, I, you yeah. know, I left that and I'm trying to make this my treasure in the current moment. So I think part of it is just to begin to turn away. We let it go. Mm-hmm. We let it go. You got to mm-hmm. let it go, gang. Mm-hmm. And you begin to once again make God your treasure. Mm-hmm. And in letting it go, this was the whole reason behind the spiritual practice of fasting. Fasting isn't just about food. Fasting is choosing to give up and forego for a time whatever it is you need to give up and forego for a time. Yeah. Is it television? Is it sex? Is it alcohol? What is it? You know, wh- what's become? Is it the praise of others? Is it ministry? You know, is it service? What do you need to fast from in order to untangle your heart and give it back to God? Yeah. In the minute you do that, you'll see how attached you are and to so many things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No condemnation, friends. Mm -hmm. We're made – for heaven. We're made for Eden, for paradise. Mm -hmm. No condemnation, but opening passage in Ezekiel 14 I read was, God will come after it in kindness in order to recapture your heart and and to grow in spiritual maturity with him, to grow in a life with him is to grow in a way that he doesn't have to. Mm -hmm. You're doing it. You know, you're vigilant, you're aware, you're conscious of the movements of your heart and soul and choosing, you know, those thousand small choices yeah. not to go there, to give certain things up, to fast for a season, whatever is needed, to repent, to withdraw, to come back to. And it's a combination of coming back to God and coming back to the hope of reward mm-hmm. that you are not insisting that this life be the big payoff. Yes. Yeah. John, I'd really enjoy, and I think the listeners would too, if you could retell the story you tell in Journey of Desire of you in the canoe. Oh, fishing, yes, right. You, <laughs> the decision you had to make. I think that – Yeah. I used to be very addicted to fly fishing, friends. And to some of you, that might just seem so silly. It's like, what are you talking about? You know, it's heroin for me. This is not even in the same category. But biochemically, actually, soulfully, your addictions are all the same category. For me, it was fly fishing because it was beauty and it was transcendence and it was joy. And in fly fishing circles, there's a T-shirt that says the tug is the drug. Like, it actually does. It releases the same chemicals in your body that other addictive substances do. It's the that momentary excitement relief. Same thing as pulling a slot machine. Anyway, so God began to come after my idolatry of fly fishing in, in a very supernatural way. First, you invited me out to the San Joaquin and the Sierras, and we were trying to have this wonderful week together. And you're like, you know, they're not big, but we're going to catch – you know, hundreds of fish, and we literally did not catch a single fish. I still can't believe that. <laughs> I still can't believe it, that. It was supernatural, and I was ticked. And so the next year, we booked this trip down on the Rio Grande in Colorado, and I'm like, no, no, we're going to nail this thing. And <laughs> there were mudslides the week you were supposed to yeah. come out, and on and on the story goes. Supernatural intervention. and uh, We had a blizzard. Remember oh, Memorial gosh. Day, three or four feet of oh, snow? Oh, my gosh. We were on the frying pan. Yeah. The frying pan river here in Colorado trying to do it, trying yep. to make it happen, trying to get a little bit of paradise. And 
Okay, so here's the story. So as the addiction begins to relinquish, I'm in a canoe. I'm on a small, high mountain lake here in Colorado. And in the evening on this lake, the fish go nuts, and they're just rising everywhere. And I'm having a ball, and I'm thinking to myself, jackpot, you know, bingo. All those things, those wonderful, warm feelings that begin to happen in your body when you're when you get your idol working for you. But then a breeze came up. Here's the problem is the breeze was pushing the canoe across the lake away from this feeding school of fish. And I couldn't both hold the paddle and paddle and keep myself in position and cast a fly rod and land fish. And there was just this moment of panic of like, I'm losing it. This is my moment. And I'm losing it. And I just set down the fly rod, but I didn't pick up the paddle. And I just let the wind just blow me gently across this lake, just holding my hands on the sides of the canoe, just enjoying beauty and God and enjoying the pleasure, the spiritual pleasure of repentance of release, of letting it go, let it go, let it go, let it go. Friends, you've been listening to the Ransom Heart Podcast, John Eldridge and Craig McConnell talking about idolatry. Hope it's been helpful. Hope it's put a few categories out there. As 1 John 5 ends that lovely little letter, he says, Oh, dear children, keep yourself from idols. Idols. 